Great. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. It's amazing to see you in person. Um, this is the first time since 2019 we've been back in this room. Uh, my name is Melissa Foley, and I'm the program manager for the Regional Monitoring Program for Water Quality in San Francisco Bay, also known as the RMP. Um, welcoming everybody to the 20th annual meeting and our first truly hybrid event. So we have about 230 people signed up to be joining us remote this morning as well. So welcome to those folks. Um, so this morning, I want to start us off with a land acknowledgement that evolved out of the collaborative efforts of the original native peoples of San Francisco Bay. Please consider that although this statement acknowledges the ancestral and unceded territories of the original Native peoples of the Bay Area, additional steps are required to move toward meaningful restorative justice. This can be working with Bay Area tribes or the tribes where you live toward ecological restoration and incorporating traditional ecological knowledge, building beneficial and constructive relationships, supporting tribes in restoring their roles as land stewards, and elevating and integrative Native communities into the planning and decision making for a healthy and resilient Bay. We acknowledge that we are on the ancestral territory of the native peoples of the San Francisco Bay, including the numerous villages and tribes of the Ohlone, Patwin, Coast Miwok, and Bay Miwok. We recognize that through a violent history of colonization and dispossession today as guests, we benefit from living and working on the traditional homeland of these native people. We wish to show our respect to them and their ancestors by acknowledging the injustices inherent to this history and by affirming their sovereign rights and their current efforts to achieve restorative justice. Consistent with our values of community inclusion and diversity, it is vitally important that we recognize the land on which we reside in unceded tribal territory and also acknowledge and support the native people that continue to form a crucial part of the San Francisco area community. So just a couple of housekeeping items uh, for Zoom, uh, folks there, please rename yourself and add your affiliation so that we know who's in the meeting. Uh, you can also set your view to active speaker during the presentations and gallery during the moderated session to get a better view of all the things that are happening. Uh, talks are being recorded and will be posted to the RMP website next week. Um, also, please use the chat function to submit questions for the Q&A and for moderated, the moderated sessions. Right. For folks in the room here, um, no food or drink in the auditorium. Uh, all of our breaks and lunch will be upstairs on the terrace. Um, stairs are just over there, um, or you can take the elevator up to the second floor. Um, there are bathrooms downstairs just behind me and upstairs, same place, just on the second floor. All right, a couple of COVID reminders. Um, I do not want this to be a super spreader event, so please help me. Um, please wear your mask at all times when indoors. Um, speakers, it's up to you if you want to take your mask off when you're standing here. Um, for folks in the audience, please don't remove your mask when we hand you a microphone if you have a question. Um, and then please use hand sanitizer, which will be distributed all over the place before partaking in food and drink. All right, with all of that, um, I would like to introduce our MC for today, Dr. Tom Mumley. Tom has been the chair of the RMP Steering Committee since 2011, um, but he's been in the, involved in the program since the beginning, helping to create the RMP, participating in several RMP work groups, and serving as a member of the Steering Committee since 2007. Tom has worked at the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Quality Control Board for 38 years um, and is currently serving as the Assistant Ex Executive Officer. Welcome, Tom. It's actually 39 now. <laughs> so okay, welcome everybody. It's actually always a pleasure for me to be able to do this and welcome you to this great event. And uh, it's a, such a celebration of, of what we can do here in the Bay Area in a collaborative 
context, et cetera. So uh, in particular, this year is, is noteworthy in that uh, we are celebrating 50 years of the Clean Water Act. And when the Clean Water Act had a major impact on the creation of the RNP and how RNP information and knowledge has been used. And, and, I'll, and let me see this. Where, why am I not, what do I got to do to advance here? I should have known this already. The down arrow, okay. Yeah, so I want to call attention. We're on the cuffs. It actually has been posted on the website, the pulse of the bay this year, and we are focusing in on right, reflecting on 50 years of the Clean Water Act. And I can tell you, there's some great perspectives written by uh, representatives of the RP community, uh, and, I, and we'll call more attention to who those people are in a bit. But also note that, as usual is the case, Jay Davis, who's sort of the lead author and the, and the editor of the of the Pulse, puts a great over perspective into play in his overview. And uh, very noteworthy is that there is a before and after set of photographs that are really, really moving. So for those that it's up there now, it's the it's called the last final version. There's still some final proofing before it gets locked in. So um, but I want to start before we go to the program is just, just realizing this is this is hardly strictly just a regional monitoring program. <laughs> and as illustrated in in Jay's article article in the in the perspectives, because it's the RNP has been a the said this before, the the catalyst bring this all together to help us coordinate, communicate, collaborate. So it's a it's had a profound impact on the Bay Area. And uh, but in the con but I also want to say though this this ain't no disco, this ain't no fooling around. But if you happen to have gone to HSB on Saturday, there was a band that had a song that had those words in it. But but this is a party, and with that in mind, I want to explain what we're going to celebrate today. Is first we're gonna we're gonna have some talks about reflecting on 50 years of the Clean Water Act. And then we're going to focus in on sort of the bread and butter of what we're all about. One is historically, we put a lot of attention on legacy contaminants, because that's what helped create us. We had to deal with what was historical pollution. Da, da, da. And then, uh, and then we start as we progress. So we've been broadening our horizons into the realm of emerging contaminants. And more re and recently, too, a lot more attention to sediment transport and the nutrient issue. And we're going to actually get an interesting talk from Dave Sand about this recent event. And I know the you know, I, we did some research too, by the way, determine where did all that red come from? Because we are suspicious. Stanford? Did they have anything to do with that? Or the 49ers? No, no, it was nothing to do with those two. So they're off the hook. And uh, but one I'll let one thing I will point out that Jay dug up a 1970 one report perhaps 72 report that epa wrote about water quality in the bay and back in those times especially reaching back into the 60s fish killed were a common event the like one year i think you pointed out in 1965 over a hundred thousand fish were dead fish were found so that was essentially pre building of our wastewater treatment plants and so we've the bay's been much better since i'll be we may be looking at further improvements as a result of the bay's vulnerability to nutrients we'll see about that but anyway let's get on with the party uh the first session uh i'm 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 the moderator so i'll just move us right into that we're going to do overview of the clean water act and I'm not going to I'm going to wait. I had some thoughts about sharing my perspective on the clean work. I'm going to save that till our discussion at the end. And let's just move right into our our speakers. First, we have the privilege of not live, but we have a we have a recorded message from Congresswoman Jackie Spear, uh, you know, you know who's very uh, made a major force representing the Bay Area in Congress for the last 14 years. And prior to that, she represented the Bay Area in the California legislature for 22 years. But most importantly, particularly recently, she's been championing uh, until recently, trying to get more resources 
to the Bay Area through the, the San Francisco Bay Improvement Fund. And last year, she was successful at least for one year to get us a $25 million boost, big time. So many of you are probably well aware of that, that that's that's in play right now. And, and the jumping head, Louisa Valeria from EPA will give us an overview of all the positive things that the, the, the fund has paid for to date at $5 million a year. But so with that, let's move into the opening remarks from Congresswoman Spear. And I'm supposed to put that there and do that. Good morning, RMP. Congratulations to each and every one of you for your tireless efforts over this past year to preserve and protect our beloved San Francisco Bay. I can't be with you in person, but I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you. For almost 30 years, the RMP has led vital data collection and research efforts to support the Bay Area's most precious natural resource the ecological jewel in our crown. This work is more important than ever. And all of us in the Bay owe you a debt of gratitude for your dedication to the cause. Today, we honor your accomplishments, which do the often unseen, but nonetheless transformative work of keeping our waters clean. The Bay provides 20 million Californians with clean drinking water and supports 4 million jobs. It's the lifeblood of the region and a worthy investment of taxpayer dollars. Every $1 spent on restoration efforts returns $2.10 in economic activity. We're also celebrating 50 years since the Clean Water Act, landmark legislation that has invested billions of dollars in improving water quality in the Bay. I'd like to commend the San Francisco Bay Regional Water Board, the San Francisco Estuary Institute, EPA Region 9, and a wide array of RMP collaborators for being strong stewards of these funds, which have helped establish a world-class monitoring program for the Bay. In Congress, I'm fighting to ensure the Bay receives its fair share of funding so that we can improve water quality, protect endangered species, revive the Bay's wetlands, and build overall climate resilience. Unfortunately, for far too long, the Bay has been shortchanged in terms of federal funding. And let me give you an example. Between 2008 and 2016, EPA geographic programs invested only $45 million in the San Francisco Bay just about $5 million each year for the largest estuary on the West Coast. The FY23 appropriations bill that recently passed the House of Representatives would include $54 million for San Francisco Bay restoration, more than double the funding the program received last year. Nonetheless, there remains more work ahead. The recent algal bloom is a reminder that challenges persist. Sea level rise is a threat to our shoreline communities, and it is critical that we protect our underserved and most vulnerable communities from these threats. This meeting is a valuable opportunity for an exchange of creative ideas and innovative solutions to address these pressing challenges. The RMP's sustained success goes to show that when we all work together, scientists, regulators, nonprofits, federal, state, and local governments, we can meet ambitious environmental goals. Thank you for your hard work and congratulations again. Have a fantastic event. All right, you heard what she said. We're gonna have a fantastic event. <laughs> Indeed. So, it be my pleasure to introduce Dr. Andrew Gunther, Andy. I'm personally privileged to be able to consider Andy a friend. And uh, in fact, I first met Andy when he was the first scientist hired by the Aquatic Habitat Institute, the precursor to the Ester San Francisco Estuary Institute. And uh, what probably was like in 87, I think, when, when you were working on the, the 
loading to the bay report and uh, come and tap to me at the water board for what I might have had some knowledge to share. But they, Andy's done a lot he, for us, for the bay. He was actually the lead scientist for the regional monitoring program at its onset in 1993 through 96-ish. He also served as an assistant uh, Scientist, lead scientist for the following up on the on the Exxon Valdez spill, and uh, and I know he's been very passionate in the in the area of climate change and leading efforts not limited to the Bay Area in in that context, and also a, a long-standing champion of save the Salmada, save the steelhead in in the Bay Region. I can go on and on about Andy, but I'm going to stop and just have him up, come up here because I know he'll entertain us as part of this great party we're having today. Thanks, Tom. So I'm uh, using this lavalier mic so I can move around a little bit. For those of you on Zoom, if I disappear, don't worry, I'll be back. So I'm really excited to be able to share this perspective on the RMP that really comes from my 30 years of being involved with the program. I've always thought that to get a solid historical understanding of the foundation of the program, you have to start with the vegetable that was key to its founding. Now, most people don't realize that Brussels sprouts were actually a key to the founding of the RMP. Uh, but it wasn't in this form, but rather on the stock, because this is the picture that Steve Ritchie used to explain the structure of the RMP to potential participants, with the stock being the status and trends program and the sprouts themselves being pilot studies. At the 10th anniversary, Steve noted of the RMP, Steve noted that the water board went ahead and amended the basin plan to add toxic um, uh, standard, toxic pollutant standards, even though there was basically no knowledge about these contaminants in the estuary. And so starting in the mid 1980s, uh, we had to set off to grow a program to get this information. And I'll be, but it really worked. The RMP has delivered essential knowledge to inform action and has provided, has built this culture of built this culture of joint fact-finding and this has positioned us really well to address future challenges i'm trying to uh we have the movement from keynote to powerpoint which always results in some strange things happening so clearly and my mother would be happy if i say this never underestimate the power of brussels sprouts right or of committed leadership provided by Steve Ritchie, Tom Mumley, Bruce Thompson, Reiner Harnicky, Jay Davis, and so many others who've been involved in the RMP. Mike Carlin, Susan Anderson, and you guys as well. Um, because there are a lot of ways this could have gone wrong, right? It didn't have to come out like this. We didn't even know how to take these measurements nor how we would pay for them. But some clever legislative work generated the Bay, Toxic, Bay Protection and Toxic Cleanup Program, which Region 2 then cleverly used to fund a pilot program to, to figure out how to design and what methods to use for the uh, long-term trace substances monitoring program. Key to this um, was the, uh, the work of these guys, Russ Flegel, and Bob Risebro, who developed and documented the methods to measure contaminants at parts per billion levels in the estuary. Russ's work, particularly on lead, was of international renown. He was an expert witness in all sorts of proceedings around leaded glassware. And, and in fact, in 10 minutes one day, Russ convinced me I should never drink a glass of wine out of a leaded wine glass. Um, and Bob was one of the leaders uh, in developing our conceptual understanding of DDT and thus other long lived organic contaminants as well and how they can impact ecosystems far from their place of use. Um, when, uh, uh, you know, when we just got started with the DDT right this was our conceptual model. Uh, 
of DDT. Um, it's wonders of its use around the home. Jay has, I love this slide, Jay gave it to me. Um, this article lauds DDT as the atomic bomb of insecticides. <laughs> Uh, but Bob's work allowed us to conceptualize DDT's impacts a little differently by documenting how they biomagnify in a food web and result in the loss of piscivorous birds because of eggshell thinning. And this picture, actually, Bob is inspecting a pelican's nest on the coast of California in 1969. But the strength of the Status and Trends Report, a, a program which is repeating the same high quality measurements over time is not a strong incentive for academic investigators who seek to publish novel investigations and pioneer new methods. So to implement the RMP, we had to figure out how to make this a commercial venture. Um, and in the end, we were able to engage a team that combined university scientists, people in nonprofits, and those in the private sector. Uh, a key component of the program was the research vessel David Johnston built and owned by the USGS, operated by UC Santa Cruz, and so ably skippered by the late Gordon Smith. Uh, the DJ was particularly valuable because it had no keel and it had recessed screws, which allowed it to access very, very shallow sites, um, like in Guadalupe Slough and Coyote, uh, up Coyote Creek and in Grizzly Bay and along the East Bay shoreline. But it also made for a rather wild ride when we would sample outside the Golden Gate, um, which led to the nauseated demise of many visitors and graduate students who thought the best day to hitch a ride would be the day you go out under the Golden Gate. We were able to engage the academic lab laboratories because they started to use the cruises as ways to train um, their students. And we allowed the opportunity to gather some additional samples for use in other investigations. Then we also had to supply the sampling equipment, right? At this time, SFEI um, what was, uh, didn't have anything really to offer in terms of, of uh, capital equipment. And so this included the CTD, which Applied Marine Sciences purchased for the first year of the program. Now, this was a rather significant expense and so I investigated insuring this purchase against accidental loss because, I, if I remember correctly, the Flegal Lab had actually lost a CTD in Sassoon Bay a couple of years before. Um, this proved to be a rather challenging endeavor because my insurance agent asked me to explain, well, how do you use this thing? And I said, well, it's simple. I take it out of the boat. I tie a rope to it, I throw it over the edge of the boat, and it goes to the bottom of the bay, and then I haul it back up. Right, said my insurance agent, as he politely declined the opportunity to ensure this activity. So our insurance was the figure eight knot that Gordon Smith taught me how to tie, um, and I practiced incessantly to make sure that we, we didn't lose the CTD in the bottom of the bay. While commercializing the program, for long-term operations, it was also essential that we maintain the commitment to the highest quality science. And that's where all of your organizations came in because this was a real strong commitment that our community had. We weren't just gonna check the boxes and say, we sampled this one, we sampled this one, we sampled this one. We wanted to be confident of the facts because the whole point was to use this information to guide policy. A key component of this was a detailed quality assurance project plan, which we wrote and then had independently peer reviewed. And then we also made the time and resources available for the technical review committee, for other special work groups. Um, and this, these are incredibly important investments made by the stakeholders of the region, right? There's some cash that they put up for the program, but the, the time, the labor that goes in to these, anyone who's ever developed a, a budget for a project knows that, that the labor costs add up very quickly. And this just represented, again, the commitment over time that this community has had to the program. Um, and then there were the outside independent reviews uh, of the program. Um, the first one in 1997, right, recommended that we kind of recast all the objectives of the program. And it was like, well, OK, you know, we, we took the review in and the revised program objectives were established in 1998. Um, and we kept thinking about the program strategically. 
meeting the program's objectives doesn't mean that you have to do the same thing every year. You know, in fact, you need to be open to well-considered changes. For example, when we started, we had three water cruises, three bioaccumulation cruises, and two sediment cruises. Um, this was a lot of work. It was a lot of money. And it was more information than we needed for given the variability of what we were measuring in order to meet our objectives. So frequencies of sampling were reduced. If I've got it now, right now, it's water sampling only occurs like every two years and sediment is every four years and um, every five years. Okay. So um, there's does the Van Dien grab get rusty? I don't know if it's flex. I mean, we were always out there. Um, so, uh, but this then allowed, right, allowed uh, funds to be made available to other high priority information needs but not to the point where the long-term data set was sacrificed. Um, similarly, we learned a lot about bioaccumulation of contaminants using transplanted bivalves, but we were really interested in the contaminant in the sport fish people were eating, and so sport fish monitoring was added to the program in 1997. And we could operate in this strategic manner because of the long-term funding commitments that were made to the program. We've kept our eye on that target. And again, it didn't have to be this way. Uh, I remember being admonished by a variety of people about how long-term programs have gone off track, either because the principal investigators were interested in other topics related that actually produced you know, things that you could publish more readily, or funders got interested in particular issues like the, the, the hotspots, delineating hotspots for contamination instead of tracking long-term contamination over time. And it's not that these aren't valid investigations to pursue, but we've had the discipline to persevere. And that discipline comes from having committed leadership. And this is something the RMP has had in spades. And, and I think it, often gets overlooked. Uh, we had the California legislature adopt the Porter Cologne Act, uh, with, what, three years before the, um, this is the, the 53rd anniversary of the Porter Cologne Act, and then the leadership from the Water Board uh, to establish the program. And then we had scientific leadership, like these guys, from these guys, and also Jim Clorin, Sam Luona, Larry Schimmel, many other people have been involved in this. Their work on the Polaris um, and using other research techniques has created this extraordinary foundation of knowledge upon which our future work is able to stand. Here's a field science scene on board the Polaris that likely feels familiar to many here, although you note there are no computers, right? Sometimes the old-fashioned sampling methods were a bit unusual. We may now have computers, but there is no replacement has yet been developed for the willing graduate student. <laughs> Those USGS scientists published this article. It was on the cover of Science Magazine in 1986, Modification of an Estuary. Um, and not only did they provide personal leadership, but USGS and other local scientists, government officials, and nonprofit leaders lent their support to the creation of the Aquatic Habitat Institute, which, as Tom noted, is now known as the San Francisco Estuary Institute. Um, and we should not forget how incredibly unique and valuable it is to have a scientific nonprofit dedicated to understanding the estuary and committed to leading our joint fact-finding. Um, I'm also particularly attached to this decision because my first job out of graduate school was with the Aquatic Habitat Institute. I think that was a great idea. Indeed, I really feel blessed to have had a front row seat to watch all this happen over the last 35 years. I've seen these scientists pass on their commitment to a new generation of scientists. Believe it or not, the beard in that picture is the same beard that's here right now. And I never considered at that time 
that I'd be some graybeard in the 2020s serving on the regional water board. But as I have served in that capacity, I have seen the influence of the RMP in almost everything we do, the permits we review, the entire approach our community takes to addressing our pollution problems. RMP data have helped establish background conditions used in NPDES permits, used for site-specific water quality objective development, resolving uncertainties in TMDLs, baseline data for nutrient analyses, and then the cutting edge analytics with PBDEs and PFAS and bisphenols and bisphenols and microplastics and all sorts of other applications. I'm gonna be looking forward to the RMP sediment bait and transport studies that is going to greatly inform our work on habitat restoration and on building shoreline resilience to sea level rise in the coming years. Our commitment to using the scientific method is everywhere. And this has allowed us to build durable and productive relationships among stakeholders. This was a key reason the RMP has received national recognition. And it's a good thing that we have these relationships and this technical foundation, because as Congresswoman Speer just noted, we have some remarkable challenges ahead of us. These include addressing emerging contaminant problems, establishing nutrient controls, considering sea level rise, including its impact on groundwater and extreme weather events, among others. And all of this, all of this is unfolding across the society that has so much injustice and inequity to address. I remain convinced that our best hope for addressing these challenges is collaborating together in good faith to discover the facts of these matters. We might then argue about what we should do about those facts, but we're not wasting our time arguing about what the facts are. And it's essential that you remain part of this endeavor. In case you haven't noticed, there are now some people in power who want to make decisions based upon belief, not physical evidence. They reject science as a way of knowing truth. We are now constantly bombarded with messages that encourage us to assume the worst about each other, to see the world as us and them, to assume that others are not working in good faith to address our joint problems. We must resist these messages, which we can do in part by using our knowledge and experience to build regional enterprises, whether it be bridges or it be programs like the regional monitoring program. Climate change and all its consequent impacts to society are becoming ever more clear. And it is obvious, no matter what we do, that the second half of this century is gonna be a very wild ride. By using evidence from observation and measurement to help establish policy, we have the best chance of making thoughtful decisions that will build a more resilient future for us all. Thanks so much for your attention. So I guess we have some time for, for some questions, if there are any. And, and somebody's looking online, I guess. So. OK. All right. Well, we'll uh, looks like we'll defer questions until lunch, huh? Well, we're going to... Uh-oh, he, he, he's got a question. No, 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 I guess at the end of this, this session, we're going to have an open dialogue that Andy is a part of. So think about, like, do I have about the early beginnings of the region mining program? That old guys like me can tell you about. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. But you, you did give me a couple thoughts while you're talking, because uh, you know, I, I was 
as he noted there at the beginning, and we were fortunate, coincident with us trying to figure out how to build the regional monitor program, that this legislation happened, the Bay Protection and Toxic Cleanup Program with some money. And we were, as a result of that, we were able to fund studies, but we we're also able to hire a person to run that program for us at the Water Board, as well as serve as a key technical lead on regional monitoring program stuff, Karen Taberski. So that's one other name I wanted to mention. It was a key early player. Um, you also remind me how privileged I have, was to be in the right place at the right time when these things emerged, coincident with the San Francisco Estuary project happening starting in the late 1980s to 1993, which has a, had a, a part of the formation of the Estuary Institute and the RNP was an outgrowth of the Estuary project, which needed to have a science program to support its plan. And as a result, though, of the construct of that, I first got to meet and start uh, making professional relationships with the scientists at USGS and other academia. So we've been really privileged as a matter of forming this RP to have this never ending collaboration with this think tank that still exists at USGS and our local academic players. So it's been great. Now, speaking about being privileged, I know to somebody, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Luisa Valiela who is a senior staff person at US EPA. Coincidentally, her career there started in 1993, somewhat coincident with the, the actual formal formation of the regional monitoring program. But Louisa is what I call a, a Jane of all trades because she her role at EPA, focusing in on wetlands and watershed planning, but also paying attention to essentially all the regulatory activities in the Bay region. And she's been a great asset for us, bringing uh, EPA's assistance and, and perspective as part of our great family. And uh, uh, what else do I want to say? I want to say that, uh, oh yeah, she was she runs the San Francisco Bay Improvement Fund, which, which Congresswoman Spear referred to, but, but Louise has been running it for I forget how many years now, and we thought this would be a good time to have have Louisa speak and tell us of all the wonderful things that have been funded by the by the fund. So come on up, Louisa. Thanks, Tom. Down arrow first. Awesome. All right. So as Tom said, I'm Luisa Valiela. I work in the water division of EPA Region 9, um, part of the San Francisco Bay family for sure. Um, we are kicking off the best day of science the Bay has to offer every year here, the RMP annual meeting. Um, such, such a special day to be back in person after several years of holding virtually, but also growing our audience out there virtually um, as well. So, Hello, everyone out there listening. Um, so today has a special flavor. We have this incredible birthday cake to talk about of just being working in San Francisco Bay, talking about the Clean Water Act and the RMP. Um, but we have some, some icing to talk about uh, the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund. Um, so this is the 50th anniversary of the Clean Water Act. I'm gonna try and bring everything around to the Clean Water Act prize, a special small token um, for anyone who wants to keep track of how many times I say Clean Water Act uh, in the course of this presentation. <laughs> All right, now, which arrow? Let's, oh, let's do this. All right, uh, when the Clean Water Act started, um, it was to bring a huge infusion of federal oversight as well as funding to solve water quality problems. Maybe Congress planned this all along, but some of the genius behind the Clean Water Act is really to invest in partnerships because the federal government wasn't going to be um, able, willing, able to be the sole source of billions of dollars needed to improve our both our waters and the infrastructure needed to ensure our waters in perpetuity. So here we have a, a map of the National Estuary Program areas. There are 28 of them. Um, one of them is our own San Francisco Estuary Partnerships. It's already been mentioned several times. 
Um, so this provides the foundation actually for our grant program. The Clean Water Act Section 320 is the National Estuary Program. Um, and having it allows our San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund, our competitive grant program, to have a funding mechanism to reach all of our, our partners who are doing work on the ground. So as Representative Jackie Spear also mentioned, the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund is actually also an EPA geographic program. Um, this is funding that is decided by Congress. Um, we, we learn every year what Congress has decided, and this is how it looks. Um, it's part of the EPA budget. It's the, called the geographic programs table. We won't spend too much time on this slide because it engenders budget envy if you compare um, to some of the other geographic programs. But here we are, one of 10. Does that look green or brown to you? Um, there should be green. Uh, I won't belabor how long it took for my government computer to pass this presentation to SFEI to be presented here. So there may be some, given how we had to make it all work, um, there may be some things that look different in what I'm looking at and what you're looking at. So these are our funding amounts over time. Tom was asking, when did this program start? It started in 2008. So we've had very steady funding and reliability study funding. There's a huge, uh, there's a huge benefit in that the re to reliably receive funding at about $5 million a year for the purposes um, under the Clean Water Act of restoring San Francisco Bay. Um, so for a number of different types of projects, very steady since 2008 until this year. Wow, look at that. This huge bump up. Um, under two different funding mechanisms. Um, the bill, which is the bipartisan infrastructure law that passed in November gave us a boost, as well as our budget appropriations due to, as Representative Spear mentioned, um, her efforts to try to move us from the featherweight version of a geographic program to a heavyweight. All right. And where does all this funding go? It goes here to all of our partners. Um, EPA, we're, we are trying to spend uh, public dollars, federal dollars um, in where it, where it needs to go to all these um, partners that are doing work on the ground. So this is kind of a, a governance a stakeholder version of primordial soup. It brings forth even more projects, progress, more partnerships. This is actually really a, a lame version of what this slide should show, which should show 80 logos, but it has been theorized that this one slide may be the reason why I couldn't send it from my government computer to <laughs> SFBI. Um, so to imagine many, many, many more, 80 total logos, um, which is where our funding has gone to. Um, maybe someday we'll have that slide to properly appreciate all of our partners that have been working on our projects through the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund. So what have these folks been doing with our funding? We tend to use these, these buckets of types of projects. So restoring water quality, restoring wetlands, and greening development, which is really our stormwater focused work. So we've had about 71 million um, total since 2008 going to these types of projects. Um, another just way of looking at our totals. This is our investments across geographically across counties. Um, you'll note that actually the tallest bar is says if you can read it, uh, it says multi county and it's really a reflection again that this investment in partnerships where we actually want to be funding work that benefits more than one project more than one place. And so there has been enormous amount of funding as well going to projects like sediment for survival report by SFEI this current work that's going on right now with the city of San Pablo in Contra Costa County to do uh, stormwater trading um, a, build a stormwater trading program for um, for our very difficult legacy pollutant issue. Um, so this this work is uh, is to benefit all of our partners and that's why it's such a big a big section um, uh, of funding. All right. Next slide. So we're going to drill down a little bit into these three different categories. Um, as I mentioned, when Senator Feinstein directed the creation of the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund prior to Jackie Spears um, involvement now, 
She had in mind continuing her legacy of wetlands restoration, given her efforts to broker the Cargill salt purchase um, that put a lot of restoration lands in public ownership. So a significant portion of our funding um, is to further the regional goal of 100,000 acres and uh, cement Senator Feinstein's legacy. Wetlands are, of course, waters of the US under the Clean Water Act, and they are regulated under Section 404 of the Clean Water Act. We have a, a map on our website, San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund map, um, that indicates where our projects are. Um, I've loosely lumped rather than split uh, the, the bay into three sections that roughly correspond to how the RMP um, segments the bay in terms of sampling. So this is North Bay, but really it's San Pablo Bay and Sassoon Bay together. But just to highlight um, that a lot of our work here, um, there's just a lot of opportunity. We're talking about large geographic extent areas, large parcels, the ability to reconnect upper watersheds with our, our deltas, our, our bay version of deltas. Um, braided systems going into the shoreline. Um, this, this investment um, will certainly continue. Um, there is this large opportunity area around Sassoon Bay, given that it is this, the, the, the place where Delta interests and Bay interests um, overlap um, very fortuitously. Our work with wetlands restoration in the Central Bay region have a, has a slightly different flavor. Um, this, as you can see from the map, is where we have you know, density of urban population. And so the, the aerial extent, our parcel size, tend to be a lot smaller. And our challenges around if we're going to restore wetlands tend to be more complicated, usually because there is legacy contamination um, at these sites. And Karen Irwin, um, a colleague of mine at EPA, will be talking later about some work to really build shoreline resilience, but also do it responsibly. That, that we that there are fund there is funding brought to do appropriate cleanup of these sites. So uh, the the South San Francisco little black flag there indicates work that we've helped uh, be a funding partner with San Francisco Rec and Park in cleaning up India Basin so that it can be both a public amenity and a restoration site, but that as in many other places um, where humans have left their messy footprint, um, there, there has to be due diligence in cleaning up these sites, which adds cost to the restoration before it can be restored, which we absolutely still want to do. And then in the South Bay, again, we have this uh, luxury, essentially a very, very large parcel sizes um, because of the South Bay salt ponds, the purchase, and now the South Bay salt pond project. Um, that has us well on our way in terms of restoring large areas to tidal restoration and their own uh, monitoring ongoing, which um, has been so eye opening and so um, uh, gratifying to see the response of the ecology, especially in fish populations, um, to see the fish assemblage return, just fish quantities. And now I think we will also learn how resilient they are if they get hit, for instance, by a harmful, harmful algal bloom, um, how quickly, this is not an area that was hit as hard, clearly, as Lake Merritt um, and some other kind of more enclosed areas. But still, we have plenty to learn about how fish populations respond after a bloom like that. Um, but again, a lot of funding going here um, to keep accelerating the, the rate of restoration given the threats of sea level rise. Um, in total, 6,100 acres of has been restored using our, our grant funds. Um, and, and we really, uh, our bottom line is wetlands restoration is, is the no regrets action related to responding to the threats of sea level rise and, and climate change. So uh, we absolutely should be doing it um, as often and as much as possible. Um, so moving into uh, restoring water quality, um, there is a seemingly never ending list of pollutants. Um, we're fortunate to have the RMP um, and this investment in regional science that guides both EPAs and our project partners um, in, in knowing where the best bang for the buck is in terms of restoring the bay and its watersheds. Um, 
we're going to hear a lot more about the issue with legacy pollutants and PCBs, certainly been an emphasis of the RMP and of our grant program as well. Um, requirements under the stormwater permit make it a top priority for our cities that are under the permit um, to, to address PCBs. We have, again, the messy footprint of humans um, really changed our creeks and rivers in our urbanized area. So we have a lot of incising, we have a lot of eroding banks, we have no floodplains, we have creeks that where you can stand where you think you're on the cliffs of Dover. Um, and, you know, this is everywhere you look um, in the Bay Area. So a lot of work also on trying to do a better job uh, restoring floodplains and reducing uh, excess sediment so that we can restore fisheries. Um, and then we have the very sad but true uh, reflection of our own economy that we have this divide, this economic divide, leaving many, many people um, unhoused. And they are often forced to, uh, forced and choose to live in our creeks um, and, and rivers. And that results in uh, a huge load of trash um, that, again, our cities are, are desperately trying to keep up with. Um, so our funding has also gone to a variety of different cities who are really trying to tackle this very uh, hard human problem, which generates a pollutant trash. I'll underscore uh, that we have spent um, with our partners uh, funding to help support the communication of the risks around eating bay caught fish. Uh, the, the San Francisco Bay does have a fish consumption advisory based on legacy con contaminants like PCBs and mercury. Um, it is very important as the Clean Water Act wanted the bay to be fishable and swimmable. Um, that, that the fishable aspect of it uh, is something that we have to continue to be vigilant on, communicate on, um, because this is a, this is a, a long lived problem, but that's what legacy contaminants mean. Um, and we, we don't have any ready fixes. Uh, so we will continue um, to work with our communities, our, our most uh, vulnerable communities around uh, the fishing community, around communication about the fish consumption advisory. So our last bucket, this uh, green stormwater infrastructure, how do, we, how do we do a better job in our Bay Area, our highly urbanized setting of the Bay Area with treating our stormwater? Um, the Clean Water Act got point sources under control, um, but there, it, the result actually is that a lot of the pollutants that reach our, our receiving water bodies, our bays, our creeks, um, come through the stormwater system. Um, our urban environment is due for a makeover, not, not just a pretty one, um, but we need better infrastructure, better infrastructure in our urbanized environment. Um, to provide exactly the same buffering effects that we point to in our in our shorelines in our wetlands. Um, they they can absorb and retain pollutants, they may not be able to handle it all. Um, we don't really often give it enough space in our urbanized environment to handle excessive volumes um, or excessive loads of a particular pollutant. Um, but we have to appreciate that green stormwater infrastructure has many benefits that it can offer multiple benefits um, and provide enough buffering effect that we can have improvements before that stormwater reaches uh, a receiving water body. We also um, are working with with SFEI and San Francisco PUC um, on some really excellent and exciting modeling work, but modeling based on you know current. Our current understanding of our urban setting, um, what a particular block in San Francisco, this is actually work that's being do done on Upper Islas Creek, um, so it's kind of the South San Francisco area, um, but places that don't have a lot of greenery, um, and what would it mean to places like that, given our current hydrology um, and, and gray infrastructure, gray pavement, um, what would it mean to start thinking about green infrastructure with trees um, in terms of the multiple benefits, not just for treating stormwater, but for the community? Um, and so the, the reducing the heat island effect um, is being documented in this report, which will be coming out soon. Um, I specifically asked for permission to show these um, graphics, which may be also why this presentation didn't send very easily. These are like, there's a lot of, um, yeah, megs, I guess, beg bites um, in these graphics. 
Um, but it's really, really interesting information. And again, this attempt to do work that is then really applicable to other urban areas so that it can be a resource, uh, a place where literature can be pointed to for the multiple benefits that green infrastructure um, can apply. So there's this particular uh, work related to trees and then really applied in a modeling setting of how much, um, how many degrees in temperature putting in trees can result in for a city block. And for me, who just saw it in the Heights for the first time, hadn't seen the movie, saw it in person, live theater, and then Abuela Claudia dies. She dies of heat stroke um, because there are too many neighborhoods of underserved populations that cannot escape, uh, cannot escape the heat. So this was fun. Um, my colleagues at EPA, uh, who helped me enormously putting together these slides so that they would be RMP worthy, and they're probably not even. The, the, you'll see the slides today. All everyone's presentations are all top notch. But we had fun putting together. We call this the horrors slide. Um, the the what what are we really facing? Um, is the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Fund ready to continue to be a source of funding? to help all of our partners really address the challenges of climate change. So our, our fire seasons that we have now, the King Tides event that have been warning us for many, many years now, you know, what sea level rise will bring. And sadly, this, this very recent harmful algal bloom that brought fish kills um, that we certainly hope um, are not a frequent recurrence. Um, and I think, Thankfully, the answer is yes, at least to, to some extent, um, this huge increase in funding um, this year, FY22, does help us, I hope, continue to be a source of funding that helps, uh, helps our partners address the challenges um, that, that everyone's facing, both under permits and, and just due diligence. And again, working in the Bay Area, everyone wants to be an, an early adopter, early actor, um, a very progressive community uh, really trying to not shy away from facing the facts um, and especially in the underserved communities um, arena um, that specifically with the bill funding the Biden administration made it quite clear that a lot of these funds are intended to build resiliency in underserved communities. I will this is not our program, but I will just say in in uh, in that kind of bailiwick of is the federal government coming with the funding that is necessary to meet these challenges, these horrors of, of climate change? Um, we also have the Clean Water SRF program, which has also received an enormous bump up in funding. Um, so I didn't wanna miss the opportunity to share that information. These are not my slides. I borrowed it from those who usually make Clean Water SRF presentations. Um, so this is federal funding that, that goes through the state um, through this loan program, but there's been a lot of other features built into the loan program to allow loan forgiveness, to allow grants, um, to really get our aging infrastructure, stormwater and wastewater treatment plant infrastructure, um, up, you know, up to speed, replaced, uh, improved, um, and this funding will continue to be available for definitely the next five years. Um, so there is time to really plan and access it as soon as possible. Um, and in particular, there is this $7 million um, carve out in California specifically for uh, combined sewer overflows, as well as stormwater um, infrastructure improvements. So with that, I thank you very much uh, for being here. Thank you, RMP. And if you have any questions on the San Francisco Bay Water Quality Improvement Act, that's my contact information. Thanks. So we, we do have time for for we segue into the recommendation part of the session. Anybody have a question specific to Louisa and the improvement fund? I really want to ask now. <laughs> All right, so uh, am I sitting down? Uh, hi, Chris. Um, is Sorry. There a method to, is there a method to the madness of the dollars that are pointed to each one of these different estuaries? Oh, uh, the slide that you weren't supposed to spend a lot of time looking at. <laughs> Maybe I didn't make the make the point because um, I 
rushing through my notes. It they did the differences in amount have to, their political decisions. They all reflect political interest. Uh, a, a particular congressman or senator that made those programs happen. That is the method to the madness. There is no other. You could have just said politics. <laughs> so, uh, well, th <laughs> thank you, Louisa. But you know what? What? What I reflect on what you're saying was that we need to add three zeros to those funding levels to actually really make a difference when you think about what it would take to fully restore the bays, wetlands, protect ourselves from climate change, sea level rise, uh, actually green our, our stormwater infrastructure and even green our wastewater infrastructure. We're talking many, 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 many billions needed. And consider the fact that the, the gross domestic product of the Bay Area is is greater than half a trillion dollars a year, you would think that we'd have ability to get more public private relationships as well as more influx of state and federal dollars back to this economic machine that the Bay Area is all about, and this wonderful Bay that we all love. So we're all we're hopeful, you know, we've we've, we've seen we've made we've gotten so much done. Uh, so the, next, the remaining part of this session is a uh, is sort of in, it's inspired by 50 years of the Clean Water Act, and uh, as I noted earlier, I think when in the pulse there are a number of, of players who have have had past current role in in water quality in the Bay Area who have written perspectives on the Clean Water Act and how it relates to things, and so some you know, so I'm going to going to call attention to who they are and then ultimately call our panel together but that's the and if any of you are here in the audience because I wasn't paying attention to who's here raise your hand so people know that but one perspective came from Alexis Strauss Hacker currently a, a board member but many of you know long-term um, leader manager at US EPA great perspective by Alexis I don't think she can make it today uh, I, uh, I uh, Richard Looker a key staff person who works with us at the Water Board in, in May, we co-authored one. And Richard, I believe, is not here, but he's participating remotely from Germany, where he's uh, visiting his wife's family. So I think he's online, and he could actually probably ask a question or correct me if I say something wrong. Let's see. Uh, we also have oh, Chris Summers, I know is here, who, who, rep who wrote a perspective representing municipal stormwater. We also had uh, one written by Tessa Beach from the Army Corps. We also had one written by John Coleman from Bay Planning Coalition, co-authored with Bridget DeShields, who represents industrial interest. She actually is the chair of the Technical Review Committee. Brid Bridget is here. Thank you. And uh, Ian Rand wrote one uh, representing the uh, San Francisco Baykeeper, Oh, yeah, 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 I thought you were here. Oops, I didn't see you, but I thought you were here. And uh, in addition, uh, Jim McGrath, I'm going to be calling up here uh, shortly, uh, you know, who is just retired San Francisco board member. But uh, just to elaborate, uh, I, Jim's career essentially started coincident with the Clean Water Act, approximately. Uh, he pointed out that he actually started as a intern or student at US EPA, I think in about 72. And then you think about the people who have affected the Bay, you can go down the list and check, check, check uh, that Jim's had a role. One thing I think very important is that he was one of the original participants on the regional monitoring program, representing the dredgers, right? And because uh, he worked, he was the environmental manager or whatever your title was at the, uh, the Port of Oakland at the time. And, uh, but he served as a, a uh, BCDC commissioner, check. He current water board member, check. Uh, he sent, serves in Berkeley on the, the waterfront commission, check. Uh, but more very importantly, uh, windsurfer, check. <laughs> uh, kayaker, check. I think he worked on the, on the Bay Trail uh, commission too, check. So lots of experience. So we're gonna have Jim come up, be part of our panel. We're also going, who, again, he wrote a perspective, Lorian uh, Fono from the Bay Clean Water Agencies, and those are the, the folks who, who treat our municipal wastewater. 
uh, to help it get as, make it as clean as it can be. So she wrote a perspective, but we're going to have Lorian come up here as well. She's the executive director of the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies, and I've lost track how many years now, the last three, four years. The pandemic has, has affected my usually photographic memory in terms of dates. I just lost two years as a blur. But she's been a, a great, I call it great ally, great helping uh, enhance the partnership that we've had with the Bay Area Clean Water Agencies. The point that they, they call themselves the Clean Water Agency is an expression that they, they consider themselves stewards of the Bay. They, they, they work for us. And uh, we, used to kind of, we used to butt heads in the old days uh, over permitting. We rarely do that now because we do joint fact finding and probably more importantly, joint fact finding and knowledge sharing. Uh, I think mean, that I always consider that implicit, but uh, just recently, Karen Mogus brought that point up about knowledge sharing. Karen Mogus is a key manager at the State Water Board. So it's not only generating the facts, but the facts uh, result in knowledge that we need to share. So what we're going to do is have uh, Andy, Louisa, Jim, and Lorian come up here. And we're going to have a panel, uh, and we're going to start with, uh, come on up. Uh, and uh, Jim and Lorian are going to uh, have a couple opening remarks just to uh, reflect on their perspective. And then we're going to have open mic for uh, dialogue. People can express your own perspectives, ask the panel members questions. Um, I might even butt my in, but I'm supposed to moderate, so I'll, I'll try to behave myself. Go for it, Jim. Good morning. Uh, this is this is as Louisa said. One of the best. Oh, it's not fit. Yeah. All right. Um, as as Louisa said, this is one of the best days for science geeks, and that's at all imaginable. I guess I'm the symbol for 50 years. Uh, I started working at, for EPA as a Cal Junior work study program. It was either that or drive a truck. I guess I got lucky. Um, I've seen a lot and, and played a lot of roles. Uh, one of the things that Andy uh, said reminded me of some of the people uh, whose shoulders that, that we stand on. Uh, the picture of Russ Flegel got to me. He was one of the uh, people that sent a letter to the governor when I was first appointed, and one of those that I'm proudest of, of supporting me for appointment. Um, then there was the picture of Fred Nichols as a young man. Fred was, of course, the chair of the, uh, the, the Aquatic Habitat Institute board. Uh, but remember Phyllis Faber, who started the Marine Agricultural Land Trust and one of my mentors on wetland restoration, and then Sylvia McLaughlin, who became a friend. Um, so. I don't really have anything to add about water quality. You've got lots of people here who know more about it than, than I do. Um, I'm way past the angst of handing off things that I used to do to people who were younger and better at it than I am. Um, you know, when you first do that, it's a little jarring. But I do want to talk about political organization and how we sustain the effort. And um, so I think there's two really important ways that we gather support. One is that we make an emotional connection to what it is that we're protecting. For me, it was the wheeling shorebirds that flash in a wetland. It was just something that reached inside of me. Currently now, it's, it's the rafts of a dozen or more um, brown pelicans back from the brink of extinction. Those things that emotionally connect you to what you're, you're protecting and how you get that across to other people. Of course, I do it on my house with a big picture uh, mural of, a, of both a salmon and a, uh, and a great egret. The next piece for, for political organization is the social connections um, and reaching out and realizing that there are recreational communities out there with bicyclists, water sport people, bird watchers, all of those have their own emotional connection to the waterfront and see it as a park. And organizing those are important for what we really have to do we need to have resilient shorelines that have the values that we trust, not big sea ones. We want that shoreline to have bike paths, wetlands, the things that sustain us. 
And to do that, we're going to have to have a connection to those people. So that's that's the big picture that I try to orient you to. Um, I'm going to continue working on those things, trying to make sure that we organize the support of those people. Now oh, that was great, Jim. I'm kind of choked up now. Um, I'm going to offer more of an industry perspective on on the Clean Water Act, um, coming from the as Tom pointed out, the clean water community. It's it's part of our brand, I guess. And uh, 50 years ago, the Clean Water Act defined what our mission was. Uh, but since then, we've broadened the vision of serving society and the environment beyond just improving uh, water quality as it's discharged to the bay. Um, the clean water community has engaged with uh, water suppliers to produce recycled water for drought resilience. We're helping the state meet its climate change mitigation goals by sequestering carbon and biosolids uh, for beneficial reuse, as well as producing clean energy from or at least uh, non fossil fuel derived energy from biogas. Uh, we've been spearheading projects to polish effluent while creating wetlands to enhance shoreline resilience and provide habitat. And then more recently, we've been participating in wastewater based epidemiology initiatives so that public health officials can understand the prevalence of communicable, communicable diseases in our communities and then on top of that, we are rebuilding the infrastructure that was built 50 years ago with the billion dollar grants, which is $7 billion in today's um, today's economy uh, that that uh, is, is aging and needs to be replaced and brought up to current standards. So the recent algal bloom is going to shift the emphasis in our region. And that doesn't mean that all these other priorities are going to be thrown out the windows, but they're going to have to be realigned um, in order to better serve what we now understand to be the health of the bay. So in summary, I guess the Clean Water Act was the beginning chapter of a story that we're still all writing together and looking forward to see what the next 50 years bring us. Super. All right. Somebody's got a question. Somebody got a point to make. Does any uh, we can get to get this party rolling here, baby. Uh, if you do want to have a question, I please just tell us who you are, just so you know we get we all we all want to get to know each other as part of this this gathering. Yes. Hi, I'm Karin. This is on. Okay, Karin North of City of Palo Alto. I just want to see um, how we're 50 years in, how the next 50 years are going as we have got to pivot and make our wastewater as a resource. And then how are we going to handle the reverse osmosis concentrate that's going to ultimately end up in the bay? I'd like to hear all of your different perspectives on that. Karen gets to hear from me all the time, um, so I figured I would. I was curious to see what everyone else was going to say because, you know, ultimately, we have needs. Send money. That's that's my message. Um, all of these problems are solvable with investments. So how can we rally the political support to get those investments and and not have these initiatives funded on the backs of rate plate payers, many of whom are very well to do and can afford it, but many of whom are already straining at the limits of affordability. And that's the sort of, uh, you know, poison pill of California um, infrastructure is that agencies aren't able to take, um, do means testing when setting rates. So being able to access grants and, and low cost loans is, is key to more equitably moving forward these priorities. 
Yeah. Uh, go ahead. I'll offer a couple of comments just on the first one. I don't know what we're going to do with the concentrate. Um, you know, it's your problem. <laughs> but but uh, more seriously, uh, when I've been on the regional board for about two years, I realized that the only solution for the, the very difficult problem of urban slobber, the runoff, it was multi-purpose reconstruction of our infrastructure. And we're engaged in that. Um, the challenge is often it needs to cross municipal boundaries because it works on a watershed. And that's very difficult for our cities who are, tend to be overstrapped. And, uh, and it needs to be well-planned and multi-purpose. And again, uh, the, the trial of our times is, is stovepipes that just don't do that very well. Yeah, so I, I, the, it's obvious that the things that we considered as waste products in past decades, we're going to realize our resources. Um, the water that comes out of our sewage uh, wastewater treatment plants is one. Uh, the sediment that, um, you know, when I authored the uh, dredging status and trends report in 1990, um, we were, you know, how do we get this stuff out of the bay more effectively was the perspective. Oops, you know, that's, that's, that's not how we're going to want to do that now. And um, there, as we watch the um, story of Hurricane Ian unfold here, you know, it's becoming clearer and clearer that uh, the powers that are we have unleashed, um, you know, we haven't yet dealt with. Uh, Bill McKibben had a short piece in The New Yorker this week, and he said something like the physical energy that's accumulated in the oceans, which, of course, is equal to a Hiroshima bomb every second, I think, um, is has not been met by the political energy but that's going to start to change and and i think we're going to have an opportunity um but i think that we need to be realistic i, I i'm looking at the influx of resources in the inflation reduction act and the infrastructure act that louisa saw as really a generational opportunity um i i don't think it's going to be there all the time um even though the problem is that big and it's going to be it's the federal government is going to be more and more engaged in humanitarian assistance um, as we get you know people tend to focus on immigration as an issue but there's it's human movement which is going to happen within the united states um, and these are going to be challenges that we're going to you know we're going to have to face a lot ourselves I think, and and I'm hopeful. I mean, we are a relatively wealthy region, and we're we have a history of working together and thinking about the future. And uh, there's a lot we can do, but but the next ten years is really the critical thing. We we have a chance to change how the Bay Area is in 2050, but that chance is what we do in the next ten years. How aggressive we can be to really think differently and move forward on some of these projects like wetlands restoration, for example, which will bear fruit in the future. Um, and, and I think that it's also really important that the younger generation are pushing on people like me to say, you know, not on my credit card, you know, you, you, you've already given me enough debt here, you pay for this, you find the money now to do this, don't just wring your hands and say we need more resources. Um, so uh, that being said, of course, exactly how we pull that off is a question, but it's going to take all of us working together and supporting like Jackie Spear. I mean, I don't know how long, maybe you'll say this, Lucy, how long we've been trying to get an increase in the San Francisco Bay Improvement Fund and how many different ways we've laid out the fact that just because Chesapeake Bay is next to Congress doesn't mean it deserves all the money. <laughs> um, and it's just like that old New Yorker cartoon, which shows like, you know, the east side streets and Central Park and then the west side streets and then New Jersey and Oklahoma and California, right, all on the same scale. 
So, so that that's a, a the challenge we face. But I really think that we have an opportunity um, by by what we do now. It's going to be really, really important. I think is that can you hear? Yeah. Um, you, you seem to ask maybe a specific question related to where we are right now in the Bay, and and you're getting some very worldly responses. Um, but I I think the the funding is here. The, the willingness, as you have many conversations with Lauren, the willingness is here to figure out what to do with the brine. Um, we, and now we have additional funding that can kind of help us hopefully nail it in the next five years, you know, really, really get an answer to that question. There's, there's a commitment, I think at all levels, federal, state, and local regulated community to get an answer to that question. Because I think your premise is absolutely right. We're all bought into, there are no, we can't afford to have waste anymore. Everything is a resource. We just have to figure out how to use it, whether it's stormwater, wastewater, sediment, absolutely. Yeah, those aren't wastes. I'm gonna take my moderator hat on, put my participant hat on and, and throw a couple of thoughts at you. Uh, think about, think of the concept of Bay Area One Water. That's the future. We are beginning to move there, but we have a long way to go. What I mean by barrier one water is integration of habitat protection, our infrastructure, making it more green, but integrating uh, water supply with water quantity, flood, water, uh, uh, stormwater quality, uh, with wastewater. We need to break down these institutional barriers that currently exist. All these utilities or non-utilities operate in silos, even within their sectors, there, there are barriers. So the future of the, of the Bay Area is going to be one water. We're going to find ways to, to do this in a collaborative manner. A good example is brought up by Karin is, as we if we're gonna put a second step back, the nutrient challenge. We've done work with, with the clean water agencies to evaluate what would it cost to upgrade all the wastewater treatment plants to get look, significantly reduce loading to the bay. We're talking more than $10 billion. If we're gonna spend $10 billion of public resources, let's make sure we know what we're doing. Just clean it up, and put it into the bay or clean it up for beneficial reuse, whether it be for potable water supply or other reuse options or and including uh habitat protection and so there's a lot of possibilities if we're going to if we're going to talk about those type of monies that's why we need to do it though in an integrated smart fashion not do it through silos on the uh reverse osmosis concentrate what they're referring to is like if you go advanced purification of wastewater to make it actually potable you use reverse osmosis you create this concentrate we actually have one discharge already going into the base uh, from Valley Water. The Santa Clara Valley Water District has an advanced purification plant adjunct to the Santa, uh, to the Santa Jose Santa Clara wastewater treatment plant. So it's taken what was already going into the bay, making it more concentrated, but the, the mass load doesn't change. And actually there's some less stuff, but it's mixed currently with San Jose's discharge. So in this case dilution is an appropriate solution because it just, knocks down the acute nature of that concentrate, but the chronic impact is no different than what was already happening. We have another plant being being developed by Valley Water, and Karin brings this up because they're now looking at doing something adjunct to the Palo Alto wastewater plant. In this case, they don't have the benefit of just putting it into Palo Alto's outfall. It would be too concentrated, but we are already working collaboratively with Valley Water with Palo Alto on this solution. And what can we allow our own concentrate going to the bay? Yes, we can. Uh, might we need to manage it? Yes. Are there options to do it? Yes, but they're expensive. Some of the conventional things are energy intensive. What's very promising is uh, it's nature based. We're actually doing pilot work as we, right now, we're looking at the effectiveness of putting RO concentrate in a horizontal levee using the, the living laboratory at Oro Loma, looking very promising that we could integrate that. Look at that win, 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 uh, if, we can, if we can really realize that. So yeah, that benefit we have in the Bay Area is these, these prob we have problem solving capability because we work together but we have to be better at it in this big picture one water arena. Ian, is that? 
Hi, thanks, Ian Rand from Baykeeper. Um, I just wanted to, I think one of the critiques of the RMP has been that it's been very effective at identifying problems and tracking trends that haven't really improved a whole lot um, over time. Um, but I was hoping that our esteemed panelists could talk about some of the wins that we have seen and how the lessons learned from that to improve conditions going forward. Well, I mean, I think that there, the, it's funny what came to mind was in part because when the RMP was started, I was also working on the uh, Exxon Valdez oil spill. And um, the way, th our ability to think through the um, analyte list and understand what we needed to measure and what we did. We were, we were measuring alkanes um, uh, in the water and the sediment and the bivalves <laughs> at one point. You know, they don't buy, really bioaccumulate. So, okay, so we crossed those off. But we also realized the point of having the alkane measurements in the sediment was to have the background in case there was an oil spill. Um, and so once we got that, we stopped and we put that money to other uses. And I think that there is, um, there are, that is a kind of, of success that, that is brought through, you know, thinking the way we've thought about it. The other is that comes to mind too, is our ability to measure copper concentrations in the water in the bay and to use that to drive a program that both reduced copper discharge to the bay, but also, if I'm remembering right, Tom said a site-specific water quality objective. Um, and again, understanding too for nickel too as well that the the background concentration in the estuary was a little higher. And so, so those are some examples that come to mind. Maybe there are others here, Jim. You must have some. Well, I, I know that that sediments near and dear to Ian as it is to me, and, and so I want to talk a little bit about not the regional monitoring strictly, but, but the relationships and the building of trust. When I started working for the Port of Oakland, uh, I worked with Laurel Marcus on trying to get dredge material in uh, Sonoma hey. Baylands, and I've had the good fortune of kayaking oh, no. with one of my board members. Now a Habitat for Endangered Species. Mm. One of the continuing concerns was the quality of the sediment, and there was a huge amount of distrust around that. Uh, I remember uh, being on radio shows with opponents of taking dredge material to uh, Montezuma Slough because of the contaminants. The contaminants, the contaminant levels were well below that on the surface of the Susun Marsh. They were clean enough all to go to the ocean, making sure that material was reused for habitat restoration rather than just taking the ocean to the ocean was a struggle. That's why my hair is all white now. But, um, I think it but sounds like that's no longer day. an issue. BCDC has changed its regulations to allow in-bay disposal. Yeah. There's conventional wisdom for what uh, came out of, of people like, uh, uh, you know, the, the USGS crew that we need sediment in the bay and we can put it in the bay with acceptable levels as long as we do it carefully. So you know to me that's a great success is realizing that we have a resource sure. and just to, to finish with and that in like my, yeah, there's, there's a half a sesame and one uh, it was phil line, woods 50 years ago that <laughs> told me everything applied in the right level is useful it's a it's a good thing to think about in a perspective to have phil's passed <laughs> I, th I think I heard in code your question was how many times did the Clean Water Act work? Um, like, how, what's the list? What's the list of pollutants that we can now check off the list um, versus not? And I, I'm off the top of my head not going to be able to list all those pollutants, but we could, and I'm sure Jay could. But I, I think, to be fair, I think as we've learned what the Clean Water Act can and can't do, um, 
is that it didn't envision combinations and accumulation and, and the effects that, that multiple pollutants can have. It's not really structured to work that way. If we were all clean for a day, I think that, that we could improve the Clean Water Act, um, but that's, that is up to Congress. Um, so, you know, and, and then there are the issue of the, of the legacy contaminants and uh, again, plug for Jay's talk, um, it's a conundrum. It's a conundrum when you have a, a, a long lived pollutant um, that is happily hunkered down in our sediments um, and, and has effects, uh, both PCBs and mercury. So, so it, it's fair to say, it, it maybe not really the Clean Water Act's fault. It's, you know, we create these pollutants and we have to do a better job when we're creating compounds to understand what they're gonna do in the environment. So I, I don't have the long view. I actually moved to this area in year 2000 and then actually learned to windsurf at the Cal Sailing Club. And I kind of take for granted that the water of the bay is swimmable, I hope. And um, uh, so my view, having been involved with the RMP for about 10 years now is that, and um, I've been engaged with the CEC work group and the, and the microplastics working group is that it is remarkable what we have in the RMP. Um, I also engage statewide with um, our partner organizations in the Central Valley and Southern California, and they, they look at what we have here in terms of our capacity to do proactive monitoring and then be able to make management decisions based on that, and it, it doesn't exist anywhere else. Um, PFAS is a really good example, taking the more shorter term view. The fact that the RMP um, has al already, before it became um, a compound of concern under the, under the national spotlight, was already doing water quality monitoring and wastewater monitoring, stormwater monitoring, and now sport fish monitoring, that's really allowed the um, informing of how we interact with statewide agencies, with legislate with legislators in order to be able to start participate in in the movement to start phasing these out um, and I think that is one of the major successes of the RMP and that's also why the clean water community in our region has committed to funding the CEC's program on a sustainable basis that's great I want to just quickly just build on what I just heard but we have met, managed heavy metals, particularly copper in the Bay. We were concerned about rising levels to the point that would be problematic, but we've stopped that rise. Uh, if you ever heard of the Brake Pad Partnership, it was an out, ultimately an outgrowth of the Region Monitoring Program or a focus on copper, which then allowed us to think, where is it coming from? And a lot, a lot of copper in runoff, a lot of copper in runoff because of brake pads. I don't know. But uh, unfortunately, the legacy stuff like PCBs and mercury, the mercury is a century and a half old problem that was created during the gold rush days. We're going to have to live with those legacies. What we want to do is prevent future legacies. The forever chemicals is a good one where hopefully we're going to get intervention now before we have a, a centuries worth of PFAS build up in the bay. A success story or the pro the provenated flame retardants PBDEs. We were seeing trends in the bay going higher and higher and higher, becoming the next PCB. Uh, but then there was legislation that basically stopped its use you know, as a flame retardant. And guess what? We're not seeing that growth anymore. So it does. We do have hope that we could stop uh, new forever chemicals, new other things, and where the regional monitoring program provides this asset is that we're not afraid to ask questions and monitor for things that others aren't monitoring. So the archaic priority pollutant list created in 1979, what, 102 or three, where we need we need the Bay Area priority pollutant list, which if you want to know what it is, look at uh, what we're doing in the, in the regional monitoring program in the realm of emerging contaminants. And you'll see we're looking at every possibility and, uh, and studying the Bay accordingly. And we will affect many major decisions, I'm sure, uh, that keep the Bay from getting adversely impacted by who knows how many possible emerging contaminants. So questions? I have a, and this is wonderful. And who are you, please? Oh, it's on. I'm with California Department of Public Health. And uh, this uh, presentation is wonderful. I just, one question I had was, 
you know, we are looking at the, all that we are doing in terms of responding to these pollutions. And uh, uh, the other part is a lot of it is coming from industry, our uh, usage and all of that. So I was wondering if it would be nice to also, other than uh, talking about what we are doing to respond to the pollutant levels, to also highlight what industry is doing and uh, how they are uh, taking care of it or how they are not taking care of it so that we can relate to where the pollution is coming from and what we can do in future in terms of our usage or industry's use of things because that is the ultimate source of the pollution of how we interact in this world. So that would be wonderful rather uh, to have that together with what we are doing to respond to the pollution. So panelists, we're at the, at the end of our time and I actually appreciate that, take that as a rhetorical question because it's a challenge that we, uh, we have to embrace the role of industry and particularly how the role of, I'll just get political, how industry affects politics and ability to get information and to, and to, uh, to uh, promulgate stewardship. So there's, there's hope. And there maybe we'll get a little bit insight to that this afternoon when we do talk about the future of managing contaminants, emerging concern. I had one other question. Did you want to ask your question? We're not going to have time to answer it, but maybe we can hear it. Because I'm just, just because you did have your hand up and I started talking. <laughs> well, from the Zoom. Just, okay. Yeah, this is from Chad and from Lester Murky, a senior scientist of uh, FSCI. He wants to ask Andy, did the NICOS science paper have any direct profound impact on funding or on community perceptions that were noticeable? Did the news media pick it up and did it engender any great epiphanies for yourself? I don't. Did you get that? The, the, the Nico science, science paper in 1980s. Just in the concept of San Francisco Bay as an ecosystem. Um, and not just as the endpoint of the wastewater treatment system. Uh, and I mean, I, I, you guys may have had this experience. I've had this experience of people saying to me when I say that I've you know, worked on San Francisco Bay, oh, there are fish in the bay? Uh, uh, they, they, people have a very, um, a lot of people have a very disconnected view. I see that as having changed enormously because of our efforts to provide public access to the shore. And I think that's something that has happened uh, in, in time coincident with the RMP. Uh, and we actually added the Bay Trail as an indicator of ecological health of the estuary just because of that, because we saw stewardship as part of that. And, and I really see that as an indicator that we have really changed things. And now that I sit on the BCDC Commission as well, it's astonishing to me every time we have to consider a permit for a development that you know the bay trail it's like goes without no one has to be reminded that if you're going to work in the bcdc zone you need to make sure the bay trail exists from one side to the other of your property right and and i think that those kind of of changes were you know i don't know i can't say how much that paper actually um you know specifically contributed to it but i do think it increased the visibility of the estuary and and the paper really goes through you know particularly fred's work on introduced species and showed that even though it's an estuary it's not what it was and it's not it's been modified and it's never going to be unmodified um, and i also think just as one if i could just say one more background piece here to our conversation is that i see us facing challenges in the next 10 years because our laws were developed under a concept that we could just take action to bring the problems 
back towards the historic target that we wanted to 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 emulate but you know that's no longer the case right so the system is in motion um, and in motion at a very high speed relative to how it's mo moved in the past and we're going to face decisions like water board members will face decisions about one problem versus another problem so there's some contaminants in the sediment but man we sure need this wetland over here and we need to put this stuff in there and um, there is an endangered species but is that endangered species habitat going away over the next 10 years so okay anyways there you go just yeah, food to food for thought. Yeah, I could go on too. <laughs> but it's, we're we're in the break. That was probably good, and you know, get more public awareness to be, you know for the future. So we're at we're actually eight into our break time. So, but let's we had twenty minutes scheduled. We ate, took a five minutes up. We should still try to come back on time, right, Melissa? So we're back here at ten fifty five. Upstairs, out in the patio, there's refreshments. So let's engage but uh we're gonna force you to come back yep. <laughs> it's tough <laughs>